Hey guys, um, so this is the second part of um, the information we didn't get to cover today in class, uh, but we're picking up with incentives that revolve around healthcare information technology. Um, and we left off talking about how the ONC really manages the infrastructure of healthcare technology and healthcare information technology. But that CMS or the Center for Medicare Medicaid Services has dominion over the incentive payments that go out um, to, the, to the participating organizations. So hopefully the video in the class, what it kind of shows you or showcase to you, really should help to give you an idea of what providers are really dealing with or, or what they dealt with too when um, EMRs and that initiative started to come down from the government. You know, yes, there was this kind of incentive in terms of financial assistance to help them finance technology and bring that into their their practices and into the hospital into the hospital system. But if you're still a provider, you know, think about how frustrating this would be. And that's one thing we talked about in class. You know, how many patients do you see a day? Um, and compound that with now you have to worry about the cost, um, the finding of the appropriate uh, health information technology, the appropriate EMR to bring into your practice, the training, the workflow, um, and all the pieces that go in with that in addition to now taking care of your patients. So you can begin to see kind of why it was really frustrating for providers and practitioners and not very welcome um, in terms of when it uh, and why there was so much resistance to the change when it came to came time to start implementing EHRs. So when we start talking about um, when we start talking about um, EHRs and EMRs, there's four main measures um, that you need to be aware of when it comes to meaningful use. And, and you know, we can call these the buckets of meaningful use. Uh, but the four areas that they can really present a challenge, and this is what you're being um, challenged with at, as a practice, as a provider, as a practitioner, and what it really means to have meaningful use. Um, so the first thing is, uh, you know, if you want to demonstrate meaningful use and receive this incentive money, you have to show progress throughout these four different buckets, we'll call them. Um, so first you have to uh, adopt and use the certified EMR system. So like we talked about in class, you can't just go out and buy any system. It has to be a certified uh, system that you can upgrade and, and have a lot of functionality to use. Um, but it also has to be able to capture data um, more for measurement and reimbursement um, aspects. And then you have to be able to move data interoperably between other systems. So if you have multiple systems, let's say a, a, at a local health system, you may have your EMR chart and then you may have your medication management software and then you may have um, a nutrition software. All of those softwares have to be able to talk to each other and have this interoperability so that we can start working on coordination and transition of care. Um, and then you have to be able to transmit or report that data back out to CMS um, and, and different registries that may collect that type of data. So when you're trying to show meaningful use, you have to show progress through each one of these individual categories or buckets. So we'll look at kind of what the adoption's been like of EMRs and EHRs. Um, and, you know, this is the last time I could find data available, and unfortunately it goes through 2013. Um, but we have, you know, at the time about 78% um, had adopted any EHR system, so any system out there, um, certified or not, um, and this was office-based physicians. And then you had um, acute care hospitals adopting certified EHR systems. So this is like your SORI and your EPIC um, that we talked about in class, and that was at about 94%. So what we see, though, is about 25% on the physician side still, for whatever reason, um, you know, there was a lot that we talked about in class, uh, still have not adopted some type of EMR or EHR system for their practice. And so you can kind of see on the next slide how we work towards this interoperability and coordination of care. We're looking at here um, acute care hospitals that exchanged, you know, different types of lab results or clinical care summaries with um, outside providers and hospitals. So a hospital sharing to a physician's office, something along those lines. We can kind of see how that's trended positively 
Um, so we have in the blue line any providers outside the organization. Um, the orange line, I guess we can call that, is ambulatory providers outside the organization. And then the green line, other hospitals outside the organization. So we can kind of start to see the trend line on how we're working to um, get towards this coordination of care piece. So I've got um, another video that I was going to show you. Now the, the quality may be a little, um, uh, the quality may lack a little in this recording. So make sure um, if you can't understand it or can't hear it very well, this is also linked up throughout your slide deck. So please make sure to watch this if you can't really hear it that well here. Um, but we're going to look at, uh, we're going to switch gears just a little bit and start talking about telemedicine. Um, and t really to expose you to the issues occurring um, and what we're seeing mainly in these rural areas where we're living right now and talk about a, a lot more barriers that we may fa face here that telehealth can help to address um, you know some unique issues and challenges that we see um, so some things I want you to think about as we watch this video you know are we getting you know this telemedicine and telehealth is really really great in terms of opening access up but are we getting enough face time with the physician um, you know and how does that affect the physician provider or uh, provider patient relationship and ultimately when when we talk about telehealth um, you know a lot of insurance companies don't want to reimburse for telehealth because you know, who is providing the, ser the, the service, essentially, and who is the responsible party? So you go to a clinic to conference in and do telehealth with a PCP who may refer you to a specialist. Um, so, you know, who holds the responsibility there for patient care? It's just a couple things I want you to consider. So we'll go ahead and watch this video. Um, if I can get it to play, Let's see if we can get it brought up here. Let me swing this over. Um, so we'll go ahead and watch this again. It's linked up through your uh, slide deck. So if you have trouble with this one, make sure to bring it up and watch it um, um, through your slide deck. This is Jennifer's story. Have you ever heard the words telehealth or telemedicine and wondered what they meant? Maybe it's a new kind of medical telephone or some new TV show about a hospital. Instead of trying to define these terms, it's best to describe what they mean with stories about real people. Meet Jennifer. Jennifer is five months pregnant and lives in a rural area in the American South. At one of her first doctor's visits, Jennifer was told that her pregnancy could be high risk. She would be monitored more closely than most pregnant women. This means more doctor's visits, more tests, more traveling from her small town, and more time away from work and family. All of this adds up to more money. Now meet Dr. Allen. Dr. Allen works at a regional health clinic 15 minutes away from Jennifer's home. Dr. Allen is a family practice physician and sees all types of patients. Dr. Allen isn't specialized in high-risk pregnancies, but there's a tool at his office that can help Jennifer and her family. The tool is a video conferencing unit. Video conferencing allows two people to communicate in real time over long distances. Sounds like a telephone, huh? Yes, but video adds the face-to-face -face element that a phone cannot offer. Video conferencing also allows users to send high-resolution medical images back and forth in real time. Okay, back to Jennifer. She has an appointment to see her doctor in the capital city of her state, which is two and a half hours away. Instead of missing work, finding babysitters, filling the car up with gas, and maybe even staying in a hotel, Jennifer can drive to her regional health clinic and see her doctor in capital city over live video. The doctor can see Jennifer, look at ultrasound images, and direct her care with the help of healthcare workers by Jennifer's side. All this is accomplished by video conferencing equipment and high-speed internet lines. Jennifer doesn't have to take time away from work or time away from her family. Jennifer gets more specialized care, cheaper and faster. That's telemedicine. This video produced by LearnTelehealth.org. A part of okay guys we'll go ahead and stop it there we move this back over um, so just to give you kind of an insight into um, some unique issues that surround telehealth um, and telemedicine and <clears throat> we'll get into those let's see we'll get into those here within this slide so talking about remote in-home monitoring um, you know we can do all kinds of great things with telemedicine uh, 
to open up access that the patients historically have not been privy to. Um, so we can work through doing some things like remote in-home monitoring where we can monitor blood pressures, glucose levels, vital signs, um, you know, keeping people in the comfort of their homes. Because, you know, who really wants to go to a hospital? If I'm sick, I want to be home in bed. Um, so hopefully through this, you know, we increase patient satisfaction and reduce hospitalizations um, by doing some maybe remote home uh, in-home monitoring through telemedicine. Um, and then something that's starting to gain a little bit of ground and a little more popularity is this thought of tele-ICU. Um, so doing some real-time assessments with these care-coordinated teams um, have shown to, uh, you know, really decrease uh, our length of stay, increase patient satisfaction, and helping to increase patient safety because we can bring this electronic piece of the puzzle um, into play. Uh, one other thing that we need to look at is distance medicine. Um, so just how, again, how do we open up more access for more of our rural counties, maybe those that don't have readily available access to healthcare providers. Um, but some issues that we're seeing with telemedicine um, you know, telemedicine can face several barriers, and when we talk about that, we need to think about licensure of physicians, especially across state lines, um, and how that kind of comes into play, because we start to become concerned with legal liability, um, and two, knowing that insurance companies aren't readily uh, willing to reimburse uh, for telehealth services, so now we have to contend with a lack of reimbursement, um, and there's also some people out there who um, really question the cost, effective, cost effectiveness of telemedicine. So while it's really great to open up access for our patients and those who may not otherwise have access to um, healthcare services, or like we saw um, in our video of Jennifer's story, um, we need to think about, you know, more of the administrative side in terms of the legal liability that it may place our system or our practitioners under, um, and, you know, knowing that we may not get reimbursed from insurance companies, how to provide these services facing our lack in reimbursement. I wanted to touch on device regulation. The book calls us out and mentions it, um, so I think it's you know important to at least dedicate one slide to it to go over so you guys can get some context into how we kind of go through device regulation and how the Affordable Care Act has affected um, devices that we use in the healthcare setting. So we have um, three different classes of device regulation, and class one or more of our um, lowest risk ones. So these are, you know, think of things like your exam gloves, um, band-aids, surgical, like handheld surgical instruments like your scalpel, things like that. Um, class two, um, a little bit more intensive. Uh, these are things like uh, your powered wheelchairs, um, surgical drapes, infusion pumps. Um, I've got a picture of some acupuncture needles up here. Um, they, these are all subject to certain types of performance standards, um, so there's certain quality metrics that they have to meet. And then class three devices, um, these are ones that uh, work to either support, like life support, or um, they, if used incorrectly, can present uh, a potential for injury or illness. Um, so these are things like your pacemakers, um, HIV diagnostic tests are considered class three, as well as AED. So if you are, you know, taking first aid, um, you use an AED in there, and those are things that are considered class three devices. Now the important thing that I want to point out here is um, through the Affordable Care Act, uh, something that came down uh, through that was a two, two, almost two and a half percent excise ta tax was put on certain medical devices. And how this is going to be impactful to you is this cost is going to start shifting. So we're going to get it from the manufacturer who's going to shift it over to the distributor. The distributor is going to shift it over to you as the health system. Um, we saw this a lot, like I said, right when the Affordable Care Act was coming out, I was working in our corporate purchasing office at the time. We started to get a lot of invoices in with this 2.3 excise tax on 
um, and, and how that works to affect the patient is we can anticipate, you know, if hospital systems, health systems are going to start paying for this excise tax, then that is eventually going to start filtering on down to the consumers. So making its way on down to our patients um, in terms of, of paying for this excise tax. So we're going to end the lecture uh, on health information technology, talking about a couple different um, impacts on different segments regarding quality of care, access, quality of life, um, the cost. And I think we're going to talk about structures as well. Um, so the impact on the quality of care, understanding that um, though technology is really good and it has been very beneficial, technology doesn't always necessarily lead to higher quality of care. Um, and only really produces quality care when we are able to achieve certain predetermined outcomes. Um, so, you know, innovations can, can sometimes cause harm, unfortunately, to the patient. Um, and I've got listed here, this is out of your book, I believe, but the criteria for quality of care, you know, in order to consider adding to the quality of care, you have to meet some of these criteria like providing a quicker cure, adding to the quality of life, minimizing side effects, things like that. And then when you think about quality of life, think about how we're able to um, increase the patient's overall satisfaction measures. Um, and what I have up here is before, during, and after medical treatment. So, you know, are we able to get them to be able to perform ADLs or activities of daily living um, in spite of any kind of impairment they may have or enable them to manage their chronic care conditions, um, you know, with better knowledge, better technology. Um, and how does this feed down into our healthcare costs? Uh, so, you know, we said at the very beginning of class that the United States leads the rest of the world in research and development. We put a lot of money into R&D, um, and that accounts for a lot of our cost increase in terms of training um, and hiring for these more specialized skills to utilize this technology, um, as well as util utilization of technology itself. So. You know, one thing we talked about towards the beginning of the semester is we work in kind of a semi-free um, market system. And what keeps us from working in a true free market system is we don't have a lot of price transparency between the consumer or the patient um, and the provider or the hospital system. So we don't know what the true cost of care is. Um, because we have the integration of the third party payer, or the insurance company. So that creates this moral hazard for us as consumers because we don't know the true cost of services. We'll be more apt to use it uh, more frequently than if we did know the true cost of services. So it integrates this kind of moral hazard aspect um, into the equation. These next ones we, we touched on through the class, um, but talking about how uh, technology opens up access for particularly more around our um, remote and very rural areas. And then uh, in regards to our structures and processes, um, just how it, it's really changing the way we deliver healthcare as a healthcare system. So we're seeing more movement towards the outpatient setting, we're seeing more movement into the patient's home, we're seeing transformations from hospitals into medical centers, um, so we're really changing the way we deliver quality care to our patients. And the last impact um, kind of category that we'll talk about it regards bioethics, um, you know, this, this would be a great conversation to have just in terms of the ethical and more moral challenges that are placed upon healthcare providers and those working in a healthcare setting, because we start talking about how technology has enabled us to do things like cloning, um, gene mapping, uh, stem cell research, life support technology, um, just so you know how we kind of come into moral conflict as providers with the things that we may be asked of by our patients or that may be coming down because of new and advancing technology. Um, so just 
to kind of end on, we'll talk about ongoing challenges um, concerning uh, technology, specifically health information technology. Um, so there's a lot of concerns around data standards because we don't have any standardization. Remember we said, is it really this simple to switch over our EMR system? And unfortunately in our country it's not because we work in a market-based system that's very decentralized um, and very destandardized. Um, so data standards can vary because we have multiple vendors that come out. You know, think back to our example, particularly in this area, we have two major health systems that both use two different types of EMRs. One uses EPIC and one uses Sorian. Um, another thing that we had discussed was privacy standards. So how, now that everything is electronic, how do we continue to ensure the, the safety and security of the patient, the practitioners, the hospital, um, from hacking, from, you know, from things like that, but two, how do we know who really owns this information? Is it owned by the hospital or is it owned by the patient? So who, you know, who owns this information essentially? And then interoperability um, is one, you know, one big thing because of the way that we have our health system set up in this market-based decentralized system. You know, we have a lot of systems that, um, information systems that may be in play within one hospital system and they don't necessarily talk to each other. You may have an EMR, um, a medication management program, and I think the example I used earlier was a nutritional um, awareness program. And those three programs may not talk, and what I mean by talk is they can't share communication across the programs. Um, so how do we get around kind of that interoperability issue um, and you know is it how we decide what vendors we go with or you know do we cut down on the number of competing vendors that may exist out there. Um, so this was the end um, of what we we're going to talk about today with health information technology. Again remember on Wednesday we are not going to be meeting in uh, our normal you know, normal meeting place, we're going to be in Nick's Hall on the third floor in the Learning Resource Center in the computer lab. If you have any questions or issues before then, please feel free to, to contact me any time, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you.